Sorry about that. Um, I got a phone call and it interrupted the video. So, uh, you know, I was talking about my parents and just, you know, the circumstances of my parents meeting, you know, um, uh, you know, my dad chose to go into the military, you know, how many, how many decisions are made in a person's lifetime leading up to, uh, and again, we've, we've mentioned the incredible probability or low probability of any one of us being here because of the sexual part, the, the sperm and the egg, and just the timing, the exact timing of that one sperm fertilizing that one egg. So think of all the decisions, all the micro decisions, and all the big decisions that people make in a lifetime leading up to the conception of a child and that child becoming part of your family tree and then you being conceived as well. You know, if my dad had not chosen to go into the military, I mean, thousands of different factors could have gotten in the way of him making that choice. Uh, think of how many decisions people make that aren't really, you know, clear cut, concrete decisions, but they just end up sort of going along with a certain path in life. Um, but, but even those things can be, I mean, those things that are, I guess what, what I would call softer decisions are probably even more easily interfered with, more easily disrupted. But all of those decisions, whether they're concrete or soft decisions, all add up to the timing, the timing of of the conception of a child later on. Um, you know, if my mother had not chosen to pursue studying the English language a little bit more than her sisters, there's a strong possibility that my dad would have bypassed her as well if, if you know, if he, being only an English speaker, um, if he was not going to be able to communicate with her very well. And so my mom's decision, maybe it was a soft decision, like, oh, I'm just interested in this and I like it and it's fun to learn English. You know, maybe it was a hard decision, like, I'm going to do this because I want to... And she ended up getting her um, physical therapy, you know, her four-year degree in Pittsburgh. So maybe she knew, and I've never asked her that, but maybe she knew she needed to really get good at English. I don't know, but either way. Um, you know, think about people surviving accidents, you know, uh, generation after generation of, of your ancestors would have had to have survived accidents of all kinds, both known and unknown, I guess you might say. Like, and I apologize, I can't remember if I mentioned this in the first, in part one, but you know, I remember as a kid, we went to Florida on vacation. On the way home, we stopped in a rest area, and we were in the car, and I said, oh, hold on, I got to tie my shoe. And I remember getting out of the car, just kneeling down on the concrete, tying my shoe. I don't know why I had to get out. And getting back in the car. And then as we drove up the road, I'm, even at the time, I think I was like nine years old, eight or nine or something, and um, a car came crashing through the median coming from the other direction and came crashing through and across all of the lanes of traffic uh, up ahead a little ways. And I remember even as a kid thinking, wow, you know, if it took me, you know, five or six seconds to tie my shoe, then, you know, that car may have been just about five or six seconds ahead of us in terms of the, you know, the speed we were traveling. So, um, people survive all kinds of accidents that are, that do happen, you know, falling down, hitting their head, you know, um, maybe if they had fallen just at a slightly different angle or something, they would have hit their head in such a way that it would have killed them. And, and then the family tree would have ended there. Um, you know, I think about, um, you know, warfare, there's been so much warfare down through the centuries and, you know, how many people have been killed in battle versus maybe a lucky few, so to speak, in any, in any one battle 
there might only be a lucky few that, that survived it and maybe one of those people became uh, one of your ancestors. Uh, you know, J.R.R. Tolkien, who wrote The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit, uh, if I understand correctly, he was in the Battle of the Somme, which was in World War I. And in that battle, the English army was devastated and there was very few survivors of it. He was one of them. So, um, or, you know, I think about the Civil War, you know, the Battle of Gettysburg, where, what was it, like, I don't know, 55,000 men were killed in three days or something like that, uh, but some survived it, you know, and those, those few that survived, you know, maybe one of them survived because he, you know, tripped over something or tripped over a, a body or something, and just as he fell, you know three bullets went whizzing through the air right where his his head and his body had been standing a moment before, you know. Um, things like that happen, and it's, it's just incredible to think, uh, you know, how people survive these things. But then, again, every single one of your ancestors obviously survived everything long enough for the next generation to be conceived and born. Think about the infant mortality rate, especially uh, down through the centuries before modern medicine or even in pretty recent times, um, you know, before the availability of penicillin and things like that. Um, you know, the infant mortality rate can be really high, you know, in a lot of places for a very long time. Um, you think about uh, um, just disease in general. Uh, the spreading of diseases, you know, you had the Black Plague, but that was only one wave of, of all kinds of diseases that went through Europe when cities were growing. You had cholera outbreaks and all kinds of stuff. I mean, so disease down through the centuries, you know, people would die from just getting a little bacterial infection somewhere in their body, but without medicines. Um, you know, people just, the, the bacteria would spread, and before they knew it, they'd have a high fever, they'd be laid up in bed, and then they their body would be overwhelmed with the infection. Um, people would die from the treatments a lot of times, because the treatments were not only ineffective, but brutal sometimes, and just outright, you know, would cause weakening of the person, or even cause their death. <clears throat> so, we think about all these things... Uh, again, just think of all the, what are all the ways in which your ancestors could have been killed or died, um, and, and the probability of them surviving certain things um, was low, maybe for centuries. Think about poor nutrition, the unavailability of <clears throat> good food. You know, you had the, the, the peasant class or the lower class, so to speak. You know, a lot of these people didn't have, you know, great uh, diets, especially in the bigger cities where, you know, food was not um, easily preserved at all um, in the summertime, or maybe people that weren't living on farms anymore. Um, so poor nutrition or infected food um, was much more rampant. Um, diseases caused by rats and animals that were having contact with human food, um, all this kind of stuff. Think of, uh, people, uh, the risks that people took to travel, especially to travel long distances or traveling on the ocean and, in uh, in boats that, um, were nowhere near the size of, you know, modern, um, cruise ships and things like that. Um, people died all the time. I mean, think of how many people have died at sea, just countless millions probably. And so, um, you know, the, the dangers of traveling on the roads through areas that, you know, the king and his men maybe didn't have control over or there were, you know, bandits and outlaws. Um, you had raiders, you had Viking raids, you had, you know, on a regular basis, there were constant acts of violence between communities or people 
you know, raiding from one community to another, um, <laughs> just down through the centuries, you know, since Adam and Eve, you know, this, all these things have been happening, and your ancestors survived all these things, you know, and so many times just seemingly a matter of luck. Um, <clears throat> the probability of two people meeting at all. You know, think of all the 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 changes the changes of heart, the changes of mind uh, when it comes to romance and people getting together and splitting up and you know, having arguments and meeting someone new and falling out of love and all these things, you know, the chances of two people, you know, getting married and, and like, okay, you're the one. I mean, there's so many factors that often do prevent two people that you think were going to be getting married or getting together, and, and then they don't. And so then the children that, that they would have produced don't get produced. And so, you know, uh, again, I'm just, I'm just amazed at the, at the incredible array of factors that had to work out <clears throat> for each one of us to be here. Not only... Uh, in regards to our own direct parents, but generation after generation after generation after generation. It's just mind-boggling. Um, I hope that you're beginning to gain or regain a sense of awe about being alive, about being here at all, about the molecules that compose your body being your body you know, um, cause they could easily be somewhere else doing something else. Um, looking at my list here. Um, so I think I've covered a lot of the, kind of the big, you know, things that, um, you know, cause death or, and, or interfere with, um, with things working out, uh, for, for you to be here. Um, now I want to I want to speak for a moment. Um, this gets more spiritual, and then I'm going to also um, bring it back. Well, let me let me start with this. There are so the purpose of this video is to reestablish, like I said, a sense of awe and appreciation uh, for the life that God has given you. That you're not an accident. Um, that you're not worthless. You know, that you're not just, you're not just that collection of molecules. You um, are precious in God's eyes beyond words because, again, the probability of you being here without God is so astronomically low that your existence really is proof of, um, of a God who has a plan for you and has an eternity waiting for you. Uh, that you can enjoy with him forever. Um, so that's, again, a whole other video. But uh, there are people who have come to believe, obviously, they've come to believe that they are worthless, that they deserve uh, rejection and condemnation. Uh, and, of course, there's a kernel of truth to that uh, from a biblical perspective Yes, we, we uh, are all sinners, and purely from a legal standpoint, we all deserve punishment from a holy God, a perfectly, uh, a, a morally perfect God. We deserve punishment. Okay, that being said, that does not eliminate our worth. So, foundationally, uh, we have to understand that what gives us our worth is two things. And uh, I think I mentioned this in another video. I'll mention it again here. The first is that we're created by God in His image. Um, so that gives us, that's the foundation of our worth. Um, God being our creator means that He created worthwhile creations. And so we are, we are that. We are His worthwhile creation. Uh, created in his image is what really um, magnifies our worth. 
So being created alone, that's enough to give us worth. But being created in his image give, gives us deep worth, uh, eternal worth. Uh, again, our sin and our mistakes can't eliminate that. Um, but the truth is even people who um, uh, go to hell and are separated from God forever, they're still made in his image. Their, their worth has not been erased. Um, but the consequences of sin are being experienced apart from a relationship with Jesus Christ. So that is very clear biblically. Um, but the second thing that gives us our worth then is that Jesus went to the cross to die for each one of us to pay a debt that he did not owe so that we would not have to try to pay a debt that we can't pay. Uh, because we can never pay God back for all the times that we have dishonored him and caused harm to others in, in a multitude of ways and um, all that. So we can never pay him back. So the second thing that gives us worth is Jesus choosing to go to the cross for us out of love. And that gives us worth as well. All right. So on the flip side then, we understand that Satan being the enemy of God, he was the greatest of angels. Jesus said, uh, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning after his rebellion against God. Angel, Satan is a real being, a real spiritual being. Uh, all of the fallen angels that are now demonic spirits originally were angelic spirits. And their, their purpose is to tear down God's creation to attack, um, to tarnish and destroy and to do everything they can to, uh, to diminish God's creation and his sovereignty. And I mean, they, they can't actually do it, but what they what they are good at is convincing us. They're good at convincing us that we no longer have any worth Right, and so um, they do that through lies and deceptions. And as I talked about in my video, feelings are like smoke alarms. We come to believe our feelings, and what our feelings are telling us, which are rooted in both sin and believed lies, um, then we believe our own feelings, which often tell us that we're worthless and no good and shameful and all these things. Um, let me pause right there. That's not to say that we aren't legitimately guilty when we do wrong. We are legitimately guilty when we do wrong. But in terms of our worth, uh, Satan attacks our worth. I'm going to do a video on self-esteem because I think it's that important of a topic. Um, but this is really getting at that. All right. And so... We want to understand that uh, that um, you know God established our worth and reestablished it on, when Jesus went to the cross. But Satan convinces a lot of people um, that they're worthless, and then out of those feelings, people will often sin even more. And and since they've kind of given up on the idea of God or a relationship with God, they just kind of give up and they kind of you know, give themselves over to their impulses and their sins and all these things. So, um, that happens frequently. I'm going to pause just for a minute here. And so part of the human struggle now is that God's truths often just feel very weak and distant and Satan's lies seem very believable and very close and very powerful. And uh, so this is one of the reasons why it's important to to get into God's Word and, and keep absorbing the truth about how God feels about you based on what God says um, and, and to, to keep reabsorbing that and keep, you know, kind of keep fighting the good fight against those, those believed lies. Okay? So, uh, one of the ways in which 
a lot of people have found themselves to be, I don't know about a lot, but there's, there's a certain population of people out here that I want to talk to for a moment. And it's people who feel like their conception, their being born into this world was somehow an accident or a mistake or maybe even a shameful thing, which sometimes this is because um, a woman is sexually assaulted or raped and a child is conceived and it was not a conception of love. And sometimes a child will grow up and, and not know anything about that, but then sometimes, you know, they find out later on that that's what happened and that's that was the circumstances of their conception and their birth. And so then, again, it's like Satan is, you know, exploding dynamite right at the foundation, which is, like I said, the foundation is that we're made in the image of God on purpose by a loving God who, who wants us to be here. But emotionally, it feels to that person like nothing could be farther from the truth. And I want to just say to you that um, there is a, uh, a truth that I think will help you. And, and this is truly uh, to just help you fight that good fight and to help you say, wait a second, no matter what happened on a human level, no matter what happened, um, God wants me here. God designed me. He designed DNA. He created me in the womb through the miracle of conception. Um, and if you think about it, just to pause here for a moment, um, no one can explain life. Science cannot explain life. And uh, again, probably another video for really exploring that. Um, so I believe that it's a miracle of God's power, God's sustaining power to create a human being and, and, and that every living cell is really sustained ultimately by God's power because there is really no chemical explanation for it. Um, and so if you look at, if you look down through your family tree, I'm guessing that there's at least one instance somewhere back down through the centuries <clears throat> where one of your direct ancestors was the product of a rape. You know, the Vikings pillaged the, the village that day, you know, and one of your great, great, great <coughs> grandmothers was brutally attacked and raped, <coughs> not killed. Again, another amazing <clears throat> miracle. And a baby was born. That baby became one of your direct ancestors. <clears throat> I would doubt that there's any, almost any family lineage, if you take it all the way back to Adam and Eve, that is completely free of any um, conception through, through a, a brutal, sinful rape. Um, if, if there is, or if there are any such family trees out there, I'm, I'm just guessing that there's not very many, ultimately. I mean, okay, if you look at a bell-shaped curve, statistically, <clears throat> you know, the bulge up in the middle is like the bulk of a population. You know, how many people like animals in general? So most people like them. Then you have, as you get towards the one end, Okay, now these are people who really like them. Now these are people who really, really like animals. They're just animal lovers. And then you have the extreme few who practically like worship animals or maybe dogs specifically or cats specifically or whatever. And then on the other end of the bell-shaped curve, you have people who aren't so thrilled with animals, but they can put up with them. And then you have people who are like, oh, I can't really even be around house pets. I just can't. I'm allergic. I don't like them, whatever. And then you have the extreme few who just absolutely go out of their way to shoot people's animals with their pellet gun or something. And so, so maybe a bell shaped curve applies to what I'm talking about here. Maybe, maybe there's 85% of all family trees where you could find 
someone in that family tree who was the product of a rape. And what I'm saying to you is that because this has happened down through human history, clearly, you know, God has used that. You know, God uses the sin of people for good on a daily basis. We don't always see it, you know. In the family tree of Jesus, um, uh, there was, um, you know, Tamar was, uh, her father-in-law, I think it was Jacob, had sex with her. And there was deception involved with that. Um, and uh, she was ostracized. Rahab was a prostitute. You know, so, and then and then you have Bathsheba, who, um, you know, David saw her bathing on her roof one night while her husband was out fighting his battles on the front lines of, of, of a battle. He sends his men to go get her because he wants her, brings her into his palace, takes her up to his bedroom, has sex with her. You know, you can't tell me that, that she was... Um, feeling good about that or you know that this was somehow like oh I finally get to be with the king I I, I don't know I'm, I probably need to reread the whole story just see if there's any bits and pieces that I've missed but you know I can only imagine that that's kind of like a date rape from a date that she didn't ask for you know so and then they had Solomon and Solomon is a direct descendant of Jesus so God uses the shameful things of human behavior, often uses them for good. Now, sometimes they don't seem to lead to any good, but, um, you know, I want to just speak to people out there who may feel like, oh, you know, that the, the facts concerning their, the, the, you know, the human circumstances of their conception and their birth are somehow shameful. And maybe they are. Maybe there's a lot of sin involved. But that doesn't mean that God doesn't want you here, because he does. And uh, God has such love for you. And uh, you're made in his image, so he, he, you know, God wants to clean the tarnish off of us, you know, and, and uh, you know, restore us to his image. And, and uh, he does that by allowing us to go through painful things that, that kind of force us to get humble and allow him to reshape us and remold us in our thinking and in our attitudes and in our hearts and, uh, and to actually develop a, uh, a love relationship with him, you know? So, um, I think I'm going to stop there. I just wanted to help you look at the incredible probability apart from God even, of being here. But then when you add God, God's the deciding factor. It doesn't matter what the probabilities are. He wants you here. Um, so I hope, I hope this has lifted you up and caused you to, you know, it's kind of like when you think about eternity, you know, you get that feeling like it's overwhelming. You know, the human brain can't comprehend eternity. And uh, it, it gives us this feeling of awe and this feeling of being overwhelmed. And uh, I hope that this has done that a little bit for you in a good way. So thanks for listening, and we'll catch you next time.